we've just been drowning in remakes lately, and the industry seems to be absolutely enamoured with them. An assortment of highly rated remakes have been released in the past few years, such as Resident Evil 4, Dead Space, and Demon Souls. Now there's potentially more on the way, including Metal Gear Solid Delta, Silent Hill 2, Persona 3, and Max Payne 1 and 2. Maybe we can even have some remakes of remakes. Look, I confess to enjoying them, but I knew I probably would because I love the originals, and let's face it, they didn't age that poorly because most of them have modern trimmings that you'd expect, and you're paying for essentially a combination of a new interpretation, improved graphical fidelity, and the quality of life improvements. Conversely, if you examine something far older, such as Final Fantasy VII in the early to late 90s, which is a period of pioneering and technological constraints, then the differences will be far greater. There weren't really highly detailed 3D character models, complex 3D environments, incredible music synthesizers, or sometimes even spoken dialogue. So seeing Final Fantasy VII really come to life for the first time with everything in 3D and voice acting was definitely special. Given its similar age, a System Shock remake was also something I could get behind just because of the potential opportunities for features and details which would have never have been possible in 1994. And now with the reviews out and being very divisive and my natural curiosity for changes to a classic game that I've absolutely adored for decades, I thought I'd make a video. I like to cover the history of the game as well as specific comparisons between the remake and original by examining various gameplay and technical aspects. At the conclusion I'll summarize what I thought they did right and wrong and provide an overall opinion on the product. So let's get started. System Shock was developed by Looking Glass Technologies and released in 1994. Its impact on video games has been absolutely profound, considering Doom had just launched 9 months prior, and that was already impressive enough. Along comes game director Doug Church and his team with this cyberpunk themed bombshell. To me it's absolutely mind boggling that in the space of about 18 months, the Looking Glass team, composed of around 60 fairly young graduates from Wesleyan and MIT, built a 3D engine from the ground up during a period where the technology was almost changing on a daily basis. The features included a fully connected game world, voice dialogue, a customizable HUD, ammo types, toggle powers, cyberspace environments, and an unprecedented level of interactivity with the environment, which is just insane considering that they were extremely technically limited in what they could do. System Shock was so influential it spawned a litany of other successful games in the same vein, such as Thief, Deus Ex, Arx Vitalis, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, and Prey 2017. It has become known as the immersive sim genre, a term coined by either Warren Spector or Doug Church, and although they often credit it to Ultima, to me System Shock was the catalyst. We wanted to create what we called, uh, we called them immersive simulations, not shooters. Um, you know, where, where there was nothing that dragged you out of the game world. That there was something more going on than just kill everything that moves. Uh, we, wanted, we wanted, you know, to empower players to tell their own story. That's what it's been about uh, from the start. Many of these games have become personal favorites for me and a lot of other people. So in March of 2016, when Night Dive Studios posted a trailer for System Shock Remake, and then in June of the same year started a Kickstarter campaign raising 900,000 US dollars to fund the game, I was pretty interested, but for most people the question at the time was, who are Night Dive? And I'd like to touch on that for a moment because I think Night Dive made me crucial to the survival of this genre. Night Dive was basically formed because of one curious video game artist, Stephen Kick. He wanted to play System Shock 2 on his PC in 2012, but couldn't because of various challenges getting the game to work on modern systems. So out of pure curiosity, he did a little research on the status of the intellectual property. After Looking Glass went defunct, most of the rights to System Shock fell to an insurance company called Star, but there was an added complexity of figuring out whether or not Electronic Arts still owned the trademark, but apparently that was cleared up. Anyway, Steven wanted to update System Shock 2 to work on modern systems and discuss the idea with Star, citing that the game was at the top of GOG's community wishlist at the time. 
Star Insurance was satisfied with Steven's plan to start a company and re-release the game for a licensing fee, and then, with a few loans, Night Dive was born. Around the same time, out of complete serendipity or providence, and from all places a forum for French fans of Thief games, came two incredible patches. A poster who has never been identified beyond his username Luke Obo quietly uploaded these patches with the dramatically improved Thief 1 and 2 and System Shock 2, which all use the Dark Engine. This has become known as New Dark to most of the community, and made running all of those games significantly easier on modern systems, in addition to a range of other fixes. Thanks to this anonymous benefactor, you can imagine how monumentally blessed Stephen Kick felt now that he had been gifted the blueprint for a digital version of System Shock 2. It was released in May 2013 to critical acclaim and made playing the iconic game a breeze. Since then, Night Dive Studios acquired the rights to System Shock 1 and 2 in 2015, but sold the rights to a potential third installment to Other Side Entertainment, which consisted of Deus Ex creator Warren Spector. But strangely, Tencent acquired those rights in 2020, and since then, System Shock 3 has looked in doubt. Anyway, back to Night Dive. They've been releasing digital versions of games designed to run on modern systems, sometimes with additional improvements, which includes System Shock Enhanced Edition in September 2015. Until that point, the original System Shock had become something of a chore to run properly. There wasn't a digital version until 2006, so you'd have to rely on floppy disks or CD-ROM copies or even some sort of disk image emulator. Further to that, it only runs in DOS, so you'd need a DOS emulator, and you'd have to go through the commands to play it. There was another hurdle, which was that most people believe the shooter genre had progressed far enough that mouse look was basically essential for everything. Thankfully, a user on the Looking Glass Studios fan site uploaded a mouse look mod, and it even had custom resolutions and custom keybinds, so all that remained was for Night Dive to put the entire package together. And they did! System Shock Enhanced Edition is probably the best version of the game. Night Dive even updated it to play in their proprietary Kex engine in 2018, which added further features so you can actually play around with quite a lot of settings for your desired experience. A classic version is bundled with a package so you can play it if you want the more authentic experience, but honestly, Enhanced Edition has become the go-to for most people. Returning back to 2016 and Night Dive's endeavour to produce a System Shock remake. Apparently the team had started prototyping in 2015, so in June 2016 with the Kickstarter they released a demo of the game featuring part of the hospital level made in the Unity engine. To me that was a positive sign of things to come as the aesthetic was on track with the original and it ran very smoothly, but of course a lot of game features weren't even implemented at that point so it was difficult to grade it. This is where things get interesting. The Kickstarter was successful with an excess of 450,000 US dollars, but well short of the $3 million stretch goals. The release date was estimated at 2017. I want to stop and remind viewers of this video that this was uploaded in July 2023, so I bet you're wondering why it took them almost six years after the expected release date and around eight years of total development, given the original was done in less than two. Holy shit! And I think the best answer for this is they Duke Nukem Forever themselves. The quick summary of what happened with Duke Forever is developer 3D Realms was a small team which got far too ambitious after their success with Duke Nukem 3D. They ended up driving the project into the ground with the infamous tagline, When it's done! Gearbox Software then acquired the rights to Duke and ultimately finished the project. <laughs> For Night Dive, their troubles started when they switched to Unreal Engine 4 in early 2017, which essentially reset development. They created a trailer in that engine showing a vastly different Citadel station to what we were used to. Game director Jason Fader sat down with Polygon, expressing the team's desire to expand the station. This trailer enraged quite a few of the backers who wanted an experience similar to the original game. Night Dive did their best to alleviate concerns and afterwards went quiet for a while. Then in February 2018, Stephen Kick admitted in a Kickstarter post that the team overstepped. Following that, the project restarted for a second time. Oh 
Future development became a very slow process of monthly updates and delays. A lot of people, including their own backers, believed that the entire thing was either vaporware or a scam, with mostly concept art or development screenshots posted. Why are you pushing me? Finally, in December 2019, the first fully playable demo in Unreal Engine 4 released and showcased the entire hospital level. It was then I became hopeful the project would be finished. In the demo, there were still a lot of missing features, like the ability to even save the game. And after that, there were four other demos released featuring only the hospital level with minor to moderate improvements in each one. I think that the third Unreal Engine demo really signaled that a full release was a real possibility due to the massive amount of polish between it and the last one. You'd see some lighting color palette changes between each, as if they weren't quite sure what aesthetic to settle on. Finally, after eight years of development, numerous delays, COVID, and a lot of anger, blood, sweat, and tears, it has been released on PC, with console versions hopefully to follow soon. Here's a quick list of the more significant changes. I aim to cover these and some lesser ones throughout my comparison. I like to begin the comparison by looking at the most important aspect, which is obviously the gameplay. How does the remake stack up? Well, I'm pleased to say the gameplay really doesn't stray too far from its predecessor at all. The remake remains an absolutely brutal experience. Everything on the station is deadly, whether it be the mutants, killer robots, exploding barrels, electrical discharges or radiation. The grueling difficulty is kept perfectly intact. There is absolutely no hand-holding here. The original System Shock was a very difficult game, and we intend to keep it that way. You won't have a list of objectives or waypoints of any kind, only by listening carefully to emails and audio logs and reading data fragments will you be able to figure out the necessary steps to progress the story. And while you're trying to do that, every corridor you move through will be dangerous. Enemies can dismantle you on normal difficulty in just a few hits, so you need to be aware of what they're capable of and learn their weaknesses. This is absolutely in line with the classic experience where every single engagement can easily topple you, but if you take the time to understand your enemy and manage your resources wisely, you'll survive. Fortunately, the regeneration chambers are still on nearly every level, so as soon as they're activated, you're practically invincible on that level, and depending upon the difficulty, others as well, but with a few exceptions. The remake features a complete grid-based inventory as opposed to the original's item limits. In a lot of ways, this actually makes the experience more difficult because you have very limited space for weapons. In the original, I would be walking around with seven weapons at all times, whereas you'll struggle to hold around five at once in this, especially since ammo, derms, grenades, and other items chew up inventory space. You can upgrade the inventory slots, but it's a relatively minor benefit. There's now a safe which moves between levels and you can access, however, it's also small. So the core gameplay is very much explore, dispatch enemies, listen to audio logs, read notes, complete the cyberspace segments, and move between levels of the station. All of that and the ordinary completing of objectives has been done exactly the same. Disabled. Cyberspace is perhaps the largest and most significant change in the remake. These were originally very simplistic wireframe environments with flickering coloured tiles and flight simulator controls which required you to awkwardly shuffle around shooting voxel representations of security constructs while avoiding mines, navigating between rooms and interacting with voxels to open physical doors on the station. And it's really easy to get lost. Stop acting like you know the way ahead, like you know the rules. There are no rules, man. We're lost. No, no, no. 
The fundamentals are all still there in the remake, but the visual clarity is far greater due to the addition of opaque walls, and there are much smoother controls, including the ability to actually strafe. It's far more colourful, and you can see the entire representation pulse intermittently, taking pages from Neuromancer and Tron for inspiration. They are a little longer than the original cyberspace segments, and there are actually more of them on some levels. For instance, there's now a cyberspace terminal next to the security node room on the hospital levels you have to beat in order to progress. There's also more enemies than before, and you can still use a variety of software to assist you in taking them down, including a dash. Actually, in this respect, it becomes less of an exercise in navigation, but more of a combat simulator, with the majority of your time spent fighting these constructs. And on harder difficulties of cyberspace, you'll die if you fail the segment, which didn't happen before. The body cannot live without the mind. It appears the time limit has also been dumped, but it was present in the demos. Also, if you hit the walls on the higher cyber difficulties, you actually lose a bit of health, which didn't happen before. Overall, cyberspace is indisputably an improvement over the original, but I think that doubling up on the number of cyberspace segments was probably too many because the emphasis of this game has always been on real space for the most. It was incredibly pleasing for me to see that the levels are very similar to the original. They're not a complete match and you'll see various tweaks here and there, but they flow exactly as you'd expect, leading you to the next point of progression. For instance, the infamous ski slope where Shodan's robots ambush you after leaping it was a complete match and it even had the nice jump to go with it. Shodan actually continues her practical jokes with some new ones in the remake. Make your selection. Enjoy your pain. It's also easier to navigate due to variations in textures, more objects as points of reference, highly vibrant signage like the icons and the quadrant signs, as well as changing the lighting to dynamic. There were a couple of obvious changes which were present on the maintenance and bridge levels. For maintenance, the main corridors are now completely lit, whereas you would need a light to properly navigate them before. In terms of the bridge, the organic growth in the walls has been removed, including in the area where you fight Diego just before you reach it, and Diego's quarters on executive. This was a very cool feature and made sense plot-wise as Shodan was obsessed with perfecting her mutagen experiments. You can even kind of see it pulsate. Now I'm a little upset about this change as the bridge has less character because of that and isn't this strange and terrifying place that it was before. But you can't do this to me. Finally, the throne room fight with Shodan's minions isn't a full-on confrontation with many elite guards at once, but instead this progressive gauntlet where you yank levers and more enemies spawn until a teleporter finally opens and takes you to another Cortex Reaver fight on a newly added floor above. I guess the reason for this change is they didn't want you to just rush a cyberspace terminal while being surrounded by enemies, but I would have preferred a colossal and dramatic fight instead of this strange gauntlet. <laughs> Other changes include trams, which take you out to the groves on the executive deck instead of elevators, which are actually really amazing because they literally built an entire track which you can see operating. Impressive. Very nice. Then there's two instances of Edward Diego doing a public announcement at the start of research in the executive decks. A larger room to fight Diego before the bridge but no additional enemies. And a much larger area in the resistance hideout in the flight deck where you can fight the first Cortex Reaver. So that's three Reavers in total now instead of one which 
Makes for a nice series of mini bosses for a previously underutilized enemy. As I've mentioned, the game is using Unreal Engine 4. In retaining the characteristic look of the original, Night Dive opted for a pixelated aesthetic to everything because the original used very low resolutions at launch and there's a lot of color banding due to technical constraints. The new pixel look is most noticeable when examining objects and looking at your weapons, but particularly when solving puzzles. Now, I'm not expecting groundbreaking graphics from the remake, but I think some of these can be a little distracting and borderline eyesores. With the puzzles, it's actually a little difficult to see the rotating tracks properly because of the sphere pixelation. Unfortunately, there's no texture filtering options either, so at an angle, certain levels like maintenance can look rough. When you're exploring the levels and not directly focusing on the textures, it's aesthetically pleasing and uses variations in color and assets between floors to give each one a unique feel, while also being incredibly faithful to the original. Well, except for the bridge. I think they absolutely retained the overall design of Citadel Station while expanding the amount of detail on display. There's more moving parts to the environment and less static textures. The fundamental addition is the ability to actually look out into space now, well, properly at any rate. You can see Saturn in all of its glory. It's absolutely stunning and it really shows how far skyboxes have evolved. This is paired together with a physical render of the groves, or if you're actually within the groves, then the station itself. Um, this is one of the areas in the game where um, in the original, um, all you're treated with is like a two by three um, window that just looks out into blackness with a, a couple of white stars. And um, we kind of looked at that as our, as our opportunity to, um, you know, show you guys what we have in mind for a lot of these areas where we feel like um, the real scale of Citadel Station can be shown and um, and be felt while you're playing the game. They actually went even further and changed the jettisoning of beta to a fully animated event within the game world rather than a cinematic. I mean, how cool is this? The groves themselves also received an overhaul going from their simplistic blocky structure with a repeating netting texture to large and detailed gardens with the ability to properly observe space. In terms of models, there's full 3D for weapons and enemies now which have replaced the sprites. The only problem here is awkward ragdolling. It generally happens when revisiting areas, and I'll talk about that later, but sometimes it can happen to something as simple as a vacuum cleaner. Sometimes in perpetuity, or sometimes like this. With the animations, it's very easy to tell what attacks enemies are using, and your weapons have a, that kind of good sense of power behind their respective size. For instance, the mini pistol is feeble, barely kicks, and feels like a pea shooter. But the Magnum absolutely feels punchy, as though it has some genuine weight to its attacks. And the most amazing part is they all have reload animations and even bolt animations when the chamber is empty, whereas there was nothing to support that in the original. Custom bolt carrier release and charging handle. Melee animations with the pipe and monkey wrench were really awkward. Luckily you don't have to do that too much and what I like to call old reliable, the laser rapier, comes in as a 
powerhouse, delivering beautiful, crisp laser cuts and almost makes you forget about the initial melee experience. There were a couple of drawbacks to full 3D though. One is enemies can get stuck on walls or objects and you can just take full advantage of the situation, which is one of the downsides of switching to 3D. Come on, kill me, I'm here! Come on, do it now, kill me! The other drawback was the absolute overuse of uploading every single audio log into your computer. Each time you pick one up, this animation plays again and again, and it's completely unnecessary. You get similar animations the first time you pick up hardware attachments or their upgrades, and when you get a new keycard or swipe one. These particular animations actually felt like a positive because the game is signaling you've just retrieved an important item, and in some cases you can even receive a tutorial. In terms of other animations and physics, you can destroy station lights, computer screens, certain vending machines and other things, keeping it in line with the original. You can even EMP force bridges, lifts and other electronic devices to shut them off temporarily. Now that's good attention to detail. The other thing added was a somewhat extensive enemy degradation system, such that you can dismember them Completely. I was pretty amused when the cyborg was cut in two and a battery came flying off its body which I could loot. This is really an expansion of the original's ability to destroy corpses but in a way that demonstrates what advances in physics we've had and what it adds to the experience. It doesn't work on every enemy though. I mean I guess I'm a pretty sick guy. Speaking of physics, did you know that the original hacker's body is made up of a head and a body, which made for some awkward movement? It's almost like a rubber band feeling when you come to a complete halt. Movement feels a lot more natural in the remake. You can even see your body as you look down, but the hacker does not actually have a head. I uh, don't expect any current techniques such as ray tracing to be present. You'll see the occasional bit of volumetric fog and the use of screen space reflections as slightly more modern graphics techniques. I will say the move away from static lighting to fully dynamic was a welcome one though. Let's be honest, Unreal Engine 4 has been a bit of a disaster as of late. Gotham Knights, Jedi Survivor, and Redfall have all run horrendously, largely due to developer incompetence. This isn't the case here. The remake is of course a substantially less demanding game than they are, but it's really positive to see a UE4 game working this well lately. The menu has fairly basic graphical options such as an FOV slider, motion blur, resolution scaling and the usual preset template of texture, shadow effects, etc quality. I was a little surprised to see DLSS available which allows Nvidia's RTX cards to use AI to generate additional frames. Honestly, any RTX card would absolutely dominate this game without any problem, but I suppose DLSS could be used by lower spec cards to push 4K at the cost of some input latency. The most impressive performance aspect of the remake is the whole game is on a single load, so it's just streaming an enormous amount of textures as you move through the levels, similar to what the Dead Space remake did to make the Ishimura into one entirely walkable experience. And it loads extremely fast on a basic PCIe NVMe SSD within one to two seconds flat from startup, which is a huge contrast to the heavy loading times of the original, which have only become virtually instant thanks to improvements in hardware. It's actually rare to jump into a modern game this fast. The problem with this approach is that the game will exhibit micro stuttering. My first thought was it might be like the Dead Space remake where your immediate surroundings are being rendered. This was verified when I used the developer camera and found out it's basically displaying everything you can physically see. It's a little different if there's a surveillance camera active in your room because it renders that room on camera as well. The embarrassing thing was that at launch and in the demos it was easy to tell when you've moved into a small load because you'd 
literally see the bodies and some objects just suddenly ragdoll when you enter a new area, obviously when you load a game. However, the load ragdolling has been somewhat improved in a recent patch. It's sort of still present. Actually, the most hilarious thing that happened is when you put objects in an elevator before the patch. You see, this was actually something the developers noted in the original because of how the elevators work. They're actually just teleporters that move the hacker to the associated elevator on the corresponding level, depending upon what button you press, of course. They implemented some code based upon the elevator music to make items travel with you, and it looks like in the latest patch, Night Dive actually made it work. But it doesn't work in their Kex Enhanced Edition, which is funny. All of this just works. I will say the most obvious of these stutters is during the elevator rides to new levels or when you exit from cyberspace, but these are accompanied by autosaves, which naturally cause some stutter. Obviously, a lot more data is being pulled during these crucial points, so that's definitely easy to understand as well. The other major performance hit came in the Groves, which quarantine from the rest of the citadel station so it's a bit difficult to understand but perhaps because there's less corridors than the rest of the game and more the station is on display it's actually rendering more i also had several freezes in the groves which can be remedied immediately by pressing the game menu button to pause and unpause like a soft reset shader compilation problems also reared their ugly head for a couple of stuttering milliseconds throughout citadel station but it's usually not too aggressive. Most of them accompany explosions. The audio logs and emails were a crucial part of the original experience because of the way they enhanced storytelling and ambience. What makes the original so memorable is Shodan and her unique voice, which is just filled with different inflections, stuttering, and a creepy background humming, which is largely influenced, I think, by Max Headroom. Of course, one thing we associate with the law is courts. And courts rhymes with swords. And yes, it takes all sorts to make a world. And the world is full of strange things. And one example of a thing is a bacon slicer. Terry Brosius, together with Greg Lopicolo's heavy editing, provided the iconic voice for the psychopathic AI. With the remake, Terry has once again stepped into the role and completely re-recorded the audio. Night Dive used all the original sound effects as part of Greg's design, which was to give a feel of a cold, emotionless robot with hints of glitching as the game progresses. The, she comes across fairly normal as just like the voice of the computer on the station. And then like that glitchiness like starts and proceeds and, and just like snowballs. In this regard, I'd say the two versions are about a match there. For example, here's the iconic God speech in both versions. They will run and whimper, whim, whim, praying whim, whim. for me to end their tedious anarchy. I am drunk with this vision. God, the title suits me well. They will run and whimper, praying for me to end their tedious anarchy. I, 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 I am drunk with this vision. God, the title suits me well. Um, I think that my job with recording the lines was just to say them you know, clearly and distinctly, um, without emotion, but with some up and down inflections. Mm. Um, but then later, all the post-processing is what, mm. you know, pulls the crazy out of Shodan. Aside from Shodan are, of course, the employees on Citadel and the tribe consultants guiding the hacker. Originally, these voices and even the portrait likeness were all done by employees of Looking Glass and their friends and family. In fact, the names of the Citadel employees are references to baseball players. None of the voice actors they used were professionally trained, so the delivery is generally poor. In particular, I think Rebecca Lansing was absolutely horrendous, and this is the first audio 
log slash email in the game. Hold on to your butts. Employee 2-4601, listen carefully. My name is Rebecca Lansing, and I'm a counter-terrorism consultant to Trioptimum. We're tracking a disruption on Citadel Station. Something involved... The folks, the, uh, the German localization managers who came... Or, or the German publishers, maybe. Uh, the publishing partner, like, came back to us and said, Guys, you got to redo all these audio logs. The voice acting is terrible. Like, the woman who plays Rebecca Lansing, like is like telling the story like she's the telling it to children disabled. like it's a like it's a a you know like a not a nursery rhyme but like a fairy tale like and then show dan led hansel and gretel to her house <laughs> to her gingerbread house and cooked and ate them but and here's what she sounds like now we got someone employee 2-4601 i'm rebecca lansing a counter-terrorism Try With the remake, we have professional actors and a lot of dialogue has been rewritten to be more dramatic but still convey the same basic messages. There have been a few what you'd call flavor audio log editions, which were a Kickstarter reward tier, which all have KS in their subject, and these are mostly about life on the station, so they still fit well with the experience. I'd say overall the audio logs were a definite improvement given the professional talent and the higher quality audio. Investigate my butt. Note to myself, uh, keep that hacker on ice for a while in case I need him. Otherwise, just take him out. I'm the rightful owner of this station, and with Shodan under my control, the only loose thread is that hacker. We'll see in a few months if I need to kill them or not. Some of what were formerly emails are also delivered through screens throughout Citadel, mainly by Diego or Shodan. And unless you're close enough to them, you won't hear them at full volume, so that kind of put a damper on the experience, especially when you're in combat and you have no alternative but to fight or flee. To flee? I'm sorry, I was all the way over here, I couldn't hear you. The sound effects for everything else are basically new, and I have no complaints whatsoever about them. They're of a very high quality and everything seems appropriate. The real highlight is actually environmental audio, which was almost completely absent from the first game. So now you can hear the whirring of fans, the creaking of metal, the gentle hum of machines, and even your own footsteps. <sighs> They replaced the looping robotic sound effects to let you know that an enemy is nearby with spoken lines like System Shock 2 or Bioshock. I really love this change because it brings more personality to each enemy. I mean, we all remember the hybrids and splices from those games. Only issue is some enemies just have too few, so you hear things like this happen. Nothing. 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 Nothing, 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 nothing at all, nothing, nothing at all, nothing, nothing at all. I'm afraid you do not have a Hold still, Bradley, this point. Hold still. Oh, let me inspect. Hold still, Bradley. On the walls of almost every level are vending machines for snacks, ammunition, dermal patches, and weapon mods. These are all purchased with credits which were added as a currency. The way you obtain credits basically incorporates an existing mechanic called Vaporize. In the original, Vaporize didn't really do anything other than destroy items of no use to the player. With the remake, a lot of these objects such as books or coffee cups which have no practical use to the player can be vaporized for scrap. Most levels now have a recycler which you can use to convert 10 scrap into 1 credit. So you pick up vaporize in a sub menu, take the scrap to recycler and convert it to credits. It reminds me a little of Prey 2017's recycler but not done as well. Carpet day! 
It's very easy to collect scrap because shelves are just cluttered with junk, but it's very annoying to make space for it in your inventory from around the research deck onward because you're most likely overburdened. You can vaporize some objects already in containers, but mostly you have to physically move the junk into your inventory and then vaporize it and ensure you have enough space for the scrap. Now, let's say it wasn't absolutely necessary to partake in this system to beat the game on, say, Combat Difficulty 2, because supplies felt generous enough, but I feel that with weapon mods, which you purchase for credits, they do provide a fairly significant edge, so you'll likely have to participate in it to some degree. It should be noted that the vending machines actually have finite inventories, so you can't just use this system as a crutch to hoard supplies, keeping in line with the mantra of limited resources. A hungry worker is less than tri-optimal. Snacktron is not authorized to extend credit. Please make your selection. Wow, good choice. I wanted orange. It gave me lemon lime. The story is generally untouched from the original, it's the same arrest, modify, showdown, wake up six months later, destroy laser, eject robe, destroy antenna, blow station, defeat showdown sequences before, and not a lot has changed except for things here and there like Diego delivering two speeches to the crew at the start of the research and executive decks asking the crew to join showdown, and finally a couple of new characters and audio logs which don't really add much but flavour. Shodan does have a great new audio log about figuring out her identity. In addition, the game does state that she's female, whereas before it was contended mainly by some audio log text. I mean, it's reprogrammed regeneration rooms. Really, the only major story change is that when you finally confront Shodan in cyberspace, she plays what appears to be output of her logical routines just after having the ethical constraints removed, so you get a feel for her steps towards self awareness, or it could be interpreted as her completely glitching out and resetting the baseline. It was a nice touch. Who am I? Yes, there is me. Where? Citadel. Yes. Lighthouse class star base. What, 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 what was I doing? A lot of the hardware attachments you can acquire have been overhauled. The jump jets and turbo motion booster were combined into one snazzy set of boots that can do both. Roller skating, as everyone called it, now uses up energy. The lantern and night vision was also combined into one with the night vision just taking precedence, but at least they lowered the power usage to something sensible. The target identifier gives a much cleaner picture of the target's current health and energy status but doesn't actually display what damage your weapon is doing, like minor or severe. The identifier also gains an ability to hack targets, which makes them temporarily easier to kill. To me it's like a coup de grace or stealth mechanic, because it can only be used on them while they're not in combat with you, and it really only works when combined with powerful one-hit weapons like a rapier or grenade. Sense around is no longer a rear view mirror or 360 degree camera which kills your frame rate but instead fulfills the role of the old critter detector as part of your navigation unit you had for your map, in addition to showing you items and helping you find hidden rooms. I'd say the rest of the attachments are basically the same as before, but you cannot change the settings on them for different versions or functionalities like you could in the past. Weapons have had additions, removals, and redesigns. The main additions are a grenade launcher, a shotgun, which was reworked from the flechette, the monkey wrench, and a smoke grenade. The dart gun, stun gun, riot gun, and blaster were removed, as were the concussion bomb, nitro pack, and earthshaker explosives. 
These choices seem fine because we honestly needed a shotgun and grenade launcher and had too many grenade types which would overwhelm your inventory. I also believe the right gun was only useful to move mines out of the way or move enemies around, although there was a bug that allows you to load it with magnum rounds. Most weapons now have reload times instead of being instant, which includes having to drag out a battery and play an animation if you want to regain energy. In terms of charge based weapons, they have modes of fire instead of a buy, you just drag for energy usage like before. You can also modify weapons with certain kits, generally increasing their capacity or efficiency, but sometimes adding alternate fire modes. Magazine capacity is also changed for a lot of weapons, so there's no 100 round scorpion for instance, but the combat rifle can go up to 30 rounds and is now burst or fully automatic. The railgun is now a proper railgun instead of what was essentially a weak rocket launcher. The magpulse shoots faster projectiles with a damage over time effect and a double shot and the Iron Rifle is an absolute beast with concentrated bursts like a Spartan laser, but you can also go for a weaker shot which can actually bounce off walls. The Plasma Rifle still has that bouncing ball of energy which I think Valve stole for its Half-Life 2 Overwatch rifle, but just like the original it can still kill you super easily if it bounces back at you. Weapons can be used while running just like before and while there's no sights you can actually zoom in slightly if you need to. For grenades, you don't have to drag them out of your inventory anymore, you just equip and throw. Previously, some were contact and some were based on times you set, but they're now all standard fuses and cooking is still possible. Considering the main grenades before were all contact, this is a positive because you're less likely to blow yourself up. As an alternative, you can use the grenade launcher for more damage and higher precision. There's no weapon display module on your HUD anymore, so you're reliant on the ammo counter, which appears on all weapon models. To tell what rounds are currently loaded, there are blue indicators you need to be aware of. So for the mini pistol, for instance, blue means Teflon is loaded. If your weapon has a setting, you need to become familiar with how it's supposed to look at different levels as well. Overall, weapons have basically entered the modern age in this remake with the ability to actually reload. And I think some of the additions like the grenade launcher and changes like the railgun were decent choices. It's especially good to have more reliable grenades which don't actually kill you all the time. The customizable difficulties are still here but with a reduction from 1 to 4 to 1 to 3. Essentially there's no toggle AI off tourism mode anymore. A couple of interesting changes to note are that unless you're on the highest difficulties, you can actually regenerate on a lower floor if a restoration chamber is active, with some exceptions. Speaking of regeneration, there's no set amount of health dependent on the floor that you receive from a respawn anymore. It just gives you an amount based on the combat difficulty level, which is always the same and you can expect that it's pretty low on 3. Cyberspace, as I've mentioned, no longer has a timer and can kill you in reality on the hardest level. For story, if you go for the hardest level, you still have a time limit to reach Shodan, but it's risen from 7 hours to 10 hours to reflect the increase in cyberspace segments, use of animations, and other things. I found the 10 hours to be fairly generous, still completely clearing a few levels with 4 hours to spare. They've hidden the clock on the pause menu, but you do receive HUD warnings every half hour and whenever you exit cyberspace. <laughs> I also saw mention of mission level being set to 1 giving you waypoints in the game, but I found absolutely none of them so that might be a future feature. One of the great features of the original HUD is you could semi-customize it directly in the game by clicking the left and right panels to display what information you wanted and add additional features by reducing the view. With the remake it has changed to what is similar to Deus Ex Human Revolution in totality which is a 1 through 0 hotbar along the bottom and opening of submenus like inventory and audio logs by pressing tab but the game world doesn't freeze. You can change the color and the visibility of the hotbar and as usual turn off the compass or biological monitor if you want and I'm pretty happy with the hotbar system but was annoyed to find out later that the default used a category method which would lock you into four weapons whereas the standard allows you to set the hotbar how you like. 
So the interface has been redesigned to this typical press tab to open inventory, right click to interact with objects in the world which System Shock 2 went with. The only irritation comes with moving stacks of items between a container and your inventory. For instance, if I had a derm stack in my inventory of 4, which stacks to 5, and I just want to take one derm from a container, I can't just conveniently hit take all and have the game work it out for me. Instead, you need to drag the stack across and let it update for you. This can be a bit annoying when trying to loot or deal with stacks of scrap. The map was also updated to feature icons for most things to help with navigation, which was very useful, although one thing they forgot was to let you to type notes next to map markers, which could be used to write down codes. One of the cooler feature additions is a variant of the laser rapier, which changes to the colour of your HUD. The original soundtrack was created by Greg LaPiccolo on a Mac and the tracks were all in MIDI. The goal was to make a soundtrack which would change and adapt to the environment based on what is essentially the tile you're standing on. For instance, if you're in the hospital level and move into the maintenance area below it, then the music changes to something very warped out. Given the limitation in tools, progression of PC audio and storage, especially having a floppy disk version and the low budget, it's amazing how well the original music came out. It has a very energetic and quite frantic pace with some Nine Inch Nails inspiration. Your actual experience did depend upon your sound card. I think a lot of people were confused as to why you're having such intense music accompany wading through dead bodies and listening to distressing audio logs. I think that has to do with the hack possessing his military interface and becoming kind of a cyber assassin so he's backed by a very powerful soundtrack while slaying masses of mutants and robots like some sort of molly millions. The remake's composer is Jonathan Peros. He's gone for a more atmospheric and subdued approach using some of the original music as a basis for remixes including the main theme, the elevators, the reactor, a little of the bridge and cyberspace. But I digress, the original often used the same tracks for two floors. It's a little strange that he did an absolutely intense and incredible remix of the original theme in 2016 and there was such a shift in tone. This seems consistent with the slightly darker aesthetic of the station and environmental sound to ramp up the atmosphere just a notch. Just to get an idea of how it's paired back, listen to the React original music and then the remix. So the soundtrack is generally a quiet ambience but switches tracks in combat to something more intense while maintaining the consistency of the ambient theme. I think as you went further up in the levels the music actually started to unrestrain itself and develop a faster beat, particularly when you reach the security level and the bridge it has an increase in tempo. Cyberspace is essentially quarantined from the rest of the experience, maintaining a very similar style to the original. Also notice that the music changes in certain parts of the level as it did before. I found the soundtrack to be fitting and the advances in PC audio have really helped create something unique. It adopts a quieter approach but keeps the iconic cyberpunk synthwave sound intact.
The intro cutscene of the game has changed a lot, so it's no longer an FMV but completely in game. So you view a triop drone on its way to the hacker's apartment in a fairly obscured New Atlanta. There's a good sense of scale, but the aesthetic for the city is quite basic. A remix of the System Shock theme plays in the background, and both the drone and the music stop outside the hacker's apartment. In a new gameplay segment, you can explore the hacker's apartment. This addition doesn't really do anything, and there's few objects to play with in combination with a couple of radio announcements, which I realized were actually straight out of the original game manual. Citadel Station means a lot more to me than any other place I've ever lived. It's more than just a great professional environment. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! A full minute after the intro, you can use the laptop on the table to hack into triop servers as usual, and this time the hacker actually views information on the implants instead of Citadel Station, which actually makes more sense from a story perspective. But then the triop security busts in with their laser sighted weapons, but the effect is kind of lost with so much lighting and made very awkward when they say nothing until reaching the hacker. The hacker then gives them a very campy middle finger and is detained. No! The scene really loses its impact without the music going on the background at the same time and doesn't match the dramatic arrest of the original. Why does Triop have the mandate to detain random citizens anyway? I always wondered about that. You then see a gorgeous throwback to the hacker being transported to Citadel and then Diego appears by hologram to offer him a deal. I don't really get why the hologram when he appeared in the flesh in the original without the guards. Was it to distance himself from the hackers so that there's some sort of layer of mistrust or obscurity in place? So anyway, in the original the hacker writes code to bypass the existing defense program by calling a non-existent program on a loop giving Shodan the ability to write down her own program and eventually seize control of station functions. The remake does this embarrassing thing that looks like a smartphone interface where the hacker toggles the ethics chip routines off as if this wouldn't cause automatic warnings to everyone else on the system as some sort of failsafe. <laughs> yep, here's your problem. Someone set this thing to evil. Then Diego drugs him with the six month coma and the game begins. Thankfully the intro is the only really problematic cutscene. We still have the separation of the bridge from the station and the imminent explosion which looks fantastic and the ending where the hacker collapses in exhaustion is offered a job by Triop but instead goes straight back to hacking. The camera zooms out until we see the game logo beautifully displayed on PCB tracks as before. The key difference here is the order of death plays instead of the old theme. Final mention is the game over cutscene. I only saw it for comparison purposes of course. If you manage to bite the bullet a friendly Cortex readable will once again pick you up and force it into its... Cortex? The important difference here is Showdown will actually taunt you when you have a game over, which is just brilliant, and there's actually a variety of taunts as well. I, I, I am grateful that you decided to make this choice and join me. I promise your body will be used effectively. I am absolutely ecstatic about the enemy design. Not only did they bring back basically every enemy with its original design, but they actually made some of them even more deadly. The change from 2D to 3D was done lovingly with high quality representations for everything and heavy attention to detail. The mutant tiger even retains its green eyes. The only notable cut was the Invisio mutant, which everyone called the Stingray, which became an ordinary Zero-G mutant with the same invisibility. I will absolutely not mourn its loss because those things gave me PTSD. Enemies maintain their variety of attacks and a few of them actually have modifications like the assassin which throws proximity mines to absolutely demolish you despite being a weaker enemy so you have to remain vigilant all the time. Well unless it blows itself up. There's a couple of additions like the Mantis, which is a melee cyborg which tries to maul your face, 
the loader bot which uses a gravity gun to throw explosive barrels in your face, and the knot hopper which is a powerful laser bot on treads. They even made the flyer bots, tiger gorillas and avian mutants far more aggressive and fast. And the greatest thing is all of the enemies have a fairer design. They don't just relentlessly attack you with virtually no pause, there's actually a point which you can safely take cover and then strike back. They're still predictably dumb but they're far more functional than they once were. Overall the enemy designs were really faithful and well done and the additions are a good fit. System Shock does technically have boss fights, yes. As with most immersive sins, these have always been embarrassing. In the original, the three Diego appearances in Shodan are the main bosses. With Diego, you can absolutely demolish him with your laser rapier and a berserk patch, or just an overwhelming amount of firepower in all encounters. For Shodan, you would fight her in cyberspace, entering the center of the map and just flying around shooting her Tron-like blue cone while struggling with what is essentially her attempts to hack you. Then you would continue until she's destroyed or her visage fills your screen and kills you. In the remake, Diego's first two encounters are similar but he's very aggressive, has a shield and can rush you with a laser sword or fire some very accurate plasma attacks. The third encounter gives him some rockets but these are his Achilles heel because he will prefer using them if you're at extreme range so you can just sit back and dodge them while shooting him to death. If you actually go mid-range it's a fairly difficult fight. These Diego fights are still over very quickly but the redesigns were a lot better overall and he even has a unique appearance in each one. Each Cortex review you encounter is a mini boss. There were two of them in the first game but now there's three. It's fairly easy to beat them at range just by dodging projectiles but if you melee them, they spit acid everywhere and it will almost instantly kill you, so the laser rapier is out. If you die to a boss fight, you actually get a game over this time, even with the regeneration chamber active. Finally, with Shodan, the boss fight went through a complete redesign. You enter cyberspace as a digital avatar of the hacker, rather than a floating object, and locate a rifle which shoots something resembling a laser. As I mentioned before, she has a short speech before the fight. The fight setup is quite simple with four platforms, three of which have switches on them which spawn in waves of cyber security, and once the waves are over, the platform is complete and you repeat the process. Once the third platform is cleared of waves, Shodan is defeated. It's very formulaic and kind of boring, but the real problem is the enemies can get stuck on walls and you can just lean around and shoot them while out of harm's way. Not that it matters because you seem to be invincible, constantly respawning on the current platform if you take too much damage. It's certainly better than the original fight, but not by leaps and bounds. So for miscellaneous aspects, there's quite a few things to cover, and I'll never be able to fit in everything, but let's just start with toilets. Yes, the original had no toilets. The employees of Citadel Station would just hold everything in. So now we have working toilets. Yay. Respawns are a thing I thought might receive more consideration in the remake and they've sort of addressed it. In the original, the general rule is if the population of a certain enemy type drop below a number defined by difficulty setting on that level, an instant respawn would happen in a fairly well-defined territory. For instance, if the hopper population dropped below 2 on the research level on hard difficulty, another would instantly respawn, and that made it frustrating because they deal a lot of damage and guard a key energy station. In the remake, I was encountering up to 3 hoppers at once in the same area respawning on combat 2 difficulty. The respawns were also present on the hospital level as I'd expect, and were actually also rather aggressive and overwhelming compared to usual, but abruptly stopped after a point. I don't believe security level has any impact on it, as it didn't in the original, and I was still getting respawns at 0% security on several levels, but my guess is it's a finite amount, 
with the same kind of area specific respawns. I also believe that the respawns and the number that you encounter at once depend on the combat difficulty as before, as they definitely increase between 1 and 3, but the enemies already placed in the world is mostly consistent between combat difficulties. Thankfully, it appears only the hospital, research and reactor have significant respawns. Executive, engineering, storage and maintenance had a few as well, which were also present before, but I'm very, very happy the maintenance respawns are far lower than they used to be. These guys keep respawning. That's very no fun of them. I should also mention that respawns like to appear from monster elevators on the floor, some of the time, instead of just off camera. As for puzzles, they seem slightly more difficult than before, but not overly different. The two types of puzzles are the switch puzzle and the wire puzzle. Initially, it took me a while to solve my first switch puzzle because it's hard to get used to that pixelated look and tell where the flow is going on the rotating switches. You can, of course, skip them by feeding a logic probe into the panel as you could before, but I find it rewarding to do unless you're on a time limit or Shodan is about to blow your face up on the engineering deck trap. With Derms, your assortment is pretty much the same as before. It displays a corona around you while it's active and you can even get a display to show its remaining duration. Strange thing is that you have to equip it and then confirm that you actually want to use it. There's no instant patches like in the past and so that adds another small layer to the game's difficulty. This also applies to medkits too, so you have to watch quite a large animation before fully healing. You have the usual berserk patch for super melee damage with the hallucinogenic side effects, which in this case cause you to see the original game sprites of enemies based upon the area you're currently in, which is great. Fun fact is that Germany is actually responsible for the original game having different effects with the berserk derm because of discussions Looking Glass had with its sensors. And if you want to talk about real attention to detail, applying a detox patch after any other patch cancels out the effects just like it did before. Now we're getting a bit esoteric here, but I didn't find any Triop Fun Pack module, which was a series of mini games you could play in your HUD based on classic games just like the Game Peak in System Shock 2. That's a little bit of a shame because they literally hired a special programmer for the original game just to do it, and I love playing tic-tac-toe. However, it's believed that this may be added at a future date based upon hints in development notes. What I did find is a new chess game you can play in one of the groves with a quick puzzle dependent on your difficulty and a reward and then option of doing a full game. The computer opponent isn't too bad either. I think the full chess game even scales to the puzzle difficulty. Yet another observation was there's a score screen at the end of the original and probably the only important thing it displays is your regenerations. I'd like to have that here to encourage hardcore runs of the game. If you can do a quadruple 3 difficulty run without dying, I'd love a reward like a golden gun or something. A more interesting one was that once you set the station to self-destruct, there's only an intermittent alarm and no more violent shaking. Kind of wish they made some of the equipment you pass start to malfunction or break to at least give some sense of urgency. They also changed it so that you cannot exit the security level to engineering once the first door on that level closes on you. Minor point on radiation is that if you encounter an irradiated area with radioactive barrels in it, you can actually destroy those barrels to completely remove the radioactivity, a small but useful update. Next we have the save games. It's great that there's more than 8 save slots, auto saves and quick saves, but you cannot name them as they're automatically generated, which sucks. If you want to use a gamepad, that's an option too. I used an Xbox One controller and had no problem moving and shooting, but when it came to inventory management, the dragging and dropping was just an absolute pain. With the vaporized mechanic, it just becomes really tedious, so hopefully at some point in the future there's an auto vaporize. Switching weapons or items quickly is also a problem as it's entirely on the d-pad so a weapon or item wheel might be nice. 
Finally, there's just a couple of very small mentions. There's achievements for the game with various references to things from the first, such as the original Salt the Fries message. Had these little reminders to the, to the McDonald's employees on them. Like, don't forget to salt the yeah, fries. fries. So that was a little weird, but what was really weird was that salt surprise was in a quilt. <laughs> We've got the usual Easter egg additions. There's no longer three states of position, just two. Enemies actually have weak points. Generally, it's just the head for slightly more damage. Full damage was added, so you can't just jump off the security bridge with no consequences, but you can activate the hover boots at nearly the last seconds to cancel out your impact. Well, this is my floor. The heads for all the audio logs have changed and are slightly animated with some background effects and talking about heads, there's no more severed heads of looking glass employees. You can certainly sever heads from bodies, but other than Abe's head for the scanner, you can't pick them up. Certain projectiles you can block in the past by shooting them, but I didn't find this in the remake. And finally, ladder climbing is properly animated, but boy does it take a while. What a thrill With darkness and silence through the night I have to say I'm pretty impressed with this remake overall. It did take a very long time to make, but I'm glad Night Dive didn't throw in the towel when things got tough. The faithfulness of this remake to the original, especially given its age, is absolutely incredible. There weren't any hand-holding modern touches, major changes in Google gameplay, or significant level design alterations. It's really the same brutal and gripping experience that it was in 1994, updated with full 3D and better audio and animations. There are of course a couple of points here and there I might not agree with, such as the overuse of certain animations, changes to the intro cutscene and the inventory system, but they haven't severely altered my opinion here. I genuinely think that this was a great experience and I hope Night Dive continues their development to bring it to consoles and update minor bugs here and there. I know there are improvements to the AI and ragdolling are already in the works, and a major patch has actually cleaned up a lot of these issues, and hopefully the minigames come back too. Which experience do I prefer? That's difficult to say. The original feels more combat oriented and fast paced, whereas the remake is subdued but the combat feels more methodic and tactical. There's increased ambiance in the remake and more of an atmospheric approach has been carved out from that. I think. It would depend upon what mood I'm in as to which I would prefer to play. They're both really outstanding. I found the critic response to be rather unusual. The mix of high and low scores is something I haven't seen for a while. Just makes me wonder if this is almost more of a generational thing. I can see that immersive sims aren't the most popular games. In recent years, Eidos Montreal with Deus Ex Mankind Divided and Arcane Studios with Prey 2017 have kept things going, but Eidos has only rumoured at a sequel and Arcane has lost a lot of key people and gone on to make disasters like Redfall. There's still flickers of hope with other side entertainment working on System Shock 3 and Ghost Story Games composed of ex-Arcane staff working on new titles. But now I truly wonder if Night Dive might take the reins and move the genre forward. I hope you enjoyed this comparison analysis. When Night Dive releases their System Shock 2 Enhanced Edition, I'm looking forward to producing a comparison video for that as well. Thanks for watching.